Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today is the month of Abib. You are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you as a sign on your head on your hand as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all the all that that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt, from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. I'll invite you to keep that text open on your laps. We'll be uh, referring to it quite a bit uh, this morning. Um, But first, let me just... uh, add my voice to Glenn's and others to welcome you to this place of worship. It's especially great to be able to see today lots of old friends and some new friends, um, some folks that are here celebrating with their fathers and with their families. Thank you for uh, joining to worship with us, and we trust that already it's been a a blessing to you. Um, I came across this meme on the Monday after Mother's Day, just about a month ago, And the heading was uh, Expositional Preachers Yesterday. And it it was a picture of a pastor, just a typical pastor in a pulpit, in two frames. In the first frame, it was the guy saying, Happy Mother's Day. And in the second frame, it it said, Anyway, turn in your Bible to the passage that we left off with last week. And uh, I have never felt so seen. And, (laughs) And of course, we're incredibly grateful to um, the Lord for all of the godly fathers that are among us and indeed the men of this congregation are um, godly men and we're thankful for them Uh, we want to wish you a happy Father's Day and we hope that you do have a wonderful day with your family and all that today will entail we'll give you a firm handshake at the end of the service we might even give you one of those bro you know hug handshake combos um but that's about it. You know, we, we typically don't interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to give a special sermon on these hallmark type occasions. That being said, it's always kind of interesting to see the passages that we are providentially given on days like this. And 
I suppose nothing will ever beat that Christmas Sunday that we came across a passage on circumcision. Um, but in God's kindness, you know, we've landed today on a passage in Exodus that speaks a lot about our Heavenly Father and about firstborn sons and about the duties that fathers and others have to commemorate and to consecrate and to catechize in light of the great things that God has, has done for us and for our salvation. Uh, we, have an, we have an occasion today to consider and to speak of a father's strong hand. A father's hands, they, they form the basis of a lot of memories. Um, they are the subjects of countless songs, and perhaps most famously is that uh, country song, that Holly Dunn song that goes, uh, well, it's called Daddy's Hands. And here's the chorus. Daddy's hands were soft and kind when I was crying. Daddy's hands were hard as steel when I'd done wrong. Daddy's hands weren't always gentle, but I've come to understand there was always love in Daddy's hands. Now let me show you another place where there's a repeated refrain about a father's strong hand, and it's today's passage. In the first 16 verses, this passage that Timothy read for us just a minute ago, we have this chorus repeated four times. And it goes like this, or uh, some variation of this very closely followed. By a strong hand, the Lord brought you out. By a strong hand, the Lord brought you out. Do you see it there? Look down, it's in verse 3. It's in verse 9, verse 14, and verse 16. And if you envision this passage as a song, that phrase is the hook. And what's in view is the momentous, the, the life-changing event of the Exodus. We looked at that great event last week. Um, but the point of the passage this week is that we would never stop looking at that great event. It would be a complete disaster, spiritually speaking, if the Israelites were to, to watch the Exodus event grow ever smaller in their rearview mirror until it, you know, it, it eventually gets so small that it disappears. On the contrary, God is going to be calling them and he's going to be calling us to keep our redemption and our release, to keep that always in front of our faces. Not, not so much in the rearview mirror, but on the front windshield, so that we're ever looking at it. Exodus simply means a going out, but we could ask, out from where? And there are a number of different ways that the text answers that question, and a lot of them um, are there for the first time in verse 3. So you can look there with me. The first is, out from Egypt. And the second points to the significance of that place. It was for the Israelites a house of slavery. It was a land that was known to them for no other reason other than they were enslaved there and they were oppressed there. That was the place where for 430 years the heavy hand of oppression was upon them. But now uh, another hand has entered the picture. It happens to be a much heavier hand than the hand of oppression, and that is the strong hand of the Lord. And this strong hand was not upon them or against them. This strong hand was for them. It was, it was against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And with that hand, you'll recall, he, he formed a fist, and he dealt ten strikes against that wicked king and his wicked kingdom. And each one of those was more devastating than the last. The final one was deadly, and it was with that strong hand that the Lord brought his people out of Egypt. And notice that word, brought out, brought out. I said that the Exodus means a going out, a departure, and it does, but I don't want the kind of the active voice of those phrases to lead you astray, okay? It's not like the Israelites just got up and left. 
It's not that they just kind of had it up to here with slavery, and so they put down their bricks, and they got up and walked out, you know, like a mass migration of New Yorkers to Florida. Um, that's not how it went at all. And whether you are enslaved to a, a godless state like they were, or whether you're a slave to sin, you need to understand that you can't just stop. You can't just have enough and extricate yourself. You cannot save yourself. The Bible is very clear about that. You can't just go out. You have to be brought out, and that by a father's strong hand. Okay, so that's the repeated refrain of this passage. By a strong hand, the Lord brought you out. This morning, we want to focus our attention on the verses that that chorus leads into and leads out of, actually. It's all uh, interwoven throughout here. The fact th of our salvation by a father's strong hand leads us to act in certain ways. So that indicative leads to a series of imperatives. And in the time that we have remaining, I want to highlight just three from the text. And in honor of the end of the school year, you know, this time of year is not just about dads, it's about grads. So in honor of that, I'm going to give you three R's, three R's today, three duties in the light of our deliverance. And the first is, Remember, remember. That's the command that comes in verse 3. And it comes in connection with the fact that the Lord brought his people out of Egypt. I hope you can notice the strong connection, the four there, the grounding. These things are, are int intricately related. Um, these people are never to forget that day on, on which they were rescued. They must never forget who it was that rescued them or how it was that he rescued them, what it took to free them from their shackles. These things must always be remembered. And as the people are receiving this command to remember on the very day that they're walking out of Egypt, I'm, I'm sure they were thinking to themselves, how is that even possible? How, how could I ever forget? This is so amazing what's happening to us today that, trust me, I'll never forget this day. I'm going to always remember. I'll, I'll be thinking about this every minute of every day for the rest of my life. Thanks anyway, Lord, but you don't have to, you don't have to command me to remember. I'm going to remember. I'm sure they were saying, they're, they're a lot like us, so they were saying things like that. But the Lord knows us so much better than we know ourselves. He, and here's just a couple of things that he knows about us concerning our memory. First of all, he knows that we're weak. He knows that we're weak. He, he knows our frame. He's the, he's the one that made us, so he remembers that we are dust. He remembers what we have such a hard time uh, remembering, which is that we're creatures with creaturely limitations, and those limitations include forgetfulness. Here's how weak I am. You know, I can't even retain a, a six-digit access code in my mind. So, like, when I'm switching from the text that it came to me on and the app that I need to use it on, i got to switch back two or three times. I can do two digits at a time. That's how, that's how weak I am. And my capacity for spiritual things seems to be way weaker even than that. Things, things just don't stick spiritually the way that I want them to or the way that I desperately need them to. It's like there's way too much fuzz built up on the Velcro of my heart and my mind. My, my spirit indeed is willing, but my flesh is oh so weak. Thankfully, the Lord knows that we're weak. And secondly, he knows that we're wicked. He knows that we're wicked. That might sound a little harsh to you, but let's just be real. That, that's what is at the heart of our failure to remember. Uh, yesterday, we went to Canada to celebrate my parents' 50th anniversary. And we gathered with uh, 100 or so of our family's closest friends. 
lot, most of whom I haven't seen in a long, long time. So there's all kinds of laughs and a lot of stories. And the interesting thing about stories I've noticed is that they get embellished quite a bit with the pas passage of time. You know, people try, try to write themselves more into the script. They, they like to have a, a more prominent, more favorable role in the story than they perhaps they had in real life. And this is what the people of Israel do. And, it, and again, they're no different from us. They are just a representative sample of humanity that the Lord is illustrating things that are true about us with. And le let me just show you how they do this. Look at verse 5. It says, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. And a, a very similar thought is included in verse 11. Now, those verses are interesting for a couple of reasons. And first of all, because they're so encouraging. They're very encouraging. Here, here is night one of what will prove to be a very long and a very difficult journey. But the Lord is speaking in no uncertain terms about the outcome that he's going to lead them to. He, he's telling them what is going to happen and where they're going to be. He's going to give them a land. He's going to give them the land of all of these pagan nations that they're presently in. Somehow they're going to all be displaced. It's as good as done because God has guaranteed it. He's bound himself to do it. He swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that he would give this land to their offspring as an inheritance. So here's a guarantee for the people that they're not just being brought out of Egypt, but that they're actually going to be brought into something. They're going to be brought all the way into an inheritance. And they aren't going to just be stuck in no man's land. The, the strong right hand that has led them out of Egypt is going to lead them all the way until their home. That, that's comforting if you're an Israelite. That's comforting if you're a child of God today. He's, he's not just brought you out of your sin. He's bringing you all the way into your inheritance. He's bringing you all the way home to glory. So this is a, an encouraging word, but it's also kind of a foreboding word. The Lord knows that there's all kinds of spiritual danger associated with their receiving this land and with their enjoying all of its milk and all of its honey. They're going to be living in good and great cities that they didn't build. They're going to be living in houses that are full of good things that they didn't fill. They're going to be drinking from cisterns that they did not dig. They're going to be eating and drinking from vineyards and olive trees that they did not plant. And the Lord knows that when they eat and they drink, believe it or not, the temptation is going to be to say something like this. Who is the Lord? Who, who is the Lord? You know, over time, we write ourselves more and more into the script. And, and we push out the main character. And mo more and more the Lord recedes out of that story and out of our thinking. And what else could you call that but wickedness? That's just outright pride and rebellion. And here's how wicked it can get. Again, learning from the Israelites. They... You know I don't like to do this, but if we were to just s skip ahead in the story a tiny bit, if I could just give you like a screenshot from Exodus 32, what you'd see there in that shot are the people bowing down to a golden calf and other objects, it seems. And they're fashioned from the gold that they had received from the Egyptians. Why? because the Lord had softened the heart of the Egyptians and given them favor in their eyes, so they were just throwing all kinds of gold and silver at them as they were leaving. But now that gold has been melted down, and as it's cooling into the shape of a calf, the Israelites say, this is what they say, here's the screenshot, these are your gods, O Israel, 
who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Can you even believe that? That's just bold-faced revisionist history. That's plain wickedness. And hopefully that shows you just how high the stakes are here. Obeying this command to remember just might save you from idolatry. Now, the classic image of remembering is, you know, the old string around your finger. And I can't help but think that's a bit of an outdated kind of image, right? I'm not sure anyone uses that technique anymore. In fact, you know, if I wanted to use it, I'd have to try to remember where I even keep string. So it, it's kind of self-defeating. Nevertheless, you can... You can picture a string tied around the finger, and I think that's similar to what the Lord is saying in verses 9 and 16. 9 and 16. You could could pick one of those just to glance at. And what we need is a a sign, a mark on our hands. We need some sort of a memorial between our eyes so that we will never forget the Lord and his law so that we'll never forget the mighty acts that he has accomplished for us and for our salvation. Now, you should know that in time, the the Jewish people, their religious leaders especially, are going to take this instruction very literally. So they're actually going to build little boxes on headbands that they put around their forehead. And in the box, they're going to have tiny little scrolls with tiny little handwriting, Uh, writing out some of these key passages. They're going to have something similar on their left shoulder that they tie around their arm so that it'll be close to their heart always. And then in time, uh, that's not good enough, so in time they're actually going to build bigger boxes, bigger stuff, make them more pronounced so that people would be impressed by their holiness. And so Jesus is going to have to rebuke the Pharisees for making their phylacteries wide. That's what those things are called, phylacteries. But of course, all of this is missing the point entirely. Jesus isn't speaking literally, he's speaking metaphorically. And we know that because in this passage, he gives us the means by which the people are to remember. He tells us exactly what it looks like for a people to have Um, the Lord and his work right between the eyes, so to speak. And it's it's a meal. It's a feast. It's an annual festival. It's a sort of Juneteenth, okay? An emancipation day celebration full of eating and reenactment and reflection and instruction. It's more like a Vivteenth or something, but anyway. Here's how, they're, here's how they're to celebrate. By eating the same meal that they were eating when they were granted their freedom. Each year, they're going to have a Passover meal. They're going to have roasted lamb over uh, bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And then for the next week, which is capped off even on the other side by another feast, The people are going to eat unleavened bread to remind them of how they had to leave that night in haste. So hastily, in fact, that the bread couldn't rise and they had to strap their kneading bowls to to themselves, carry it on their shoulder. No time for the bread to rise, forced to eat unleavened bread. And this feast, this annual remembrance feast is the God-appointed way that they would remember This is what it looks like to have the Lord and his law as a mark on the head and between the eyes. And friends, we've talked about this many, many times, but, you know, so I don't really have to belabor this point, but the Christ-appointed way that he gives to his people to remember him and also all that he has accomplished for their salvation is also a meal. It's a feast. It's a regular communion with him and with with his family so as to bring right to the forefront of our minds, right between the eyes, so to speak, 
a remembrance of all Christ has done and how he has freed us from our slavery to sin and from s- slavery to self and slavery to Satan. And so we sing, Behold the Lamb who takes our sins away. Eat and remember. The body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, torn for you. Eat and remember. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin. Drink and remember. Do this in remembrance of me. It's our duty, having been so wonderfully delivered by the Father's strong hand, to remember. And secondly, it's our duty to rehearse. It's our duty to rehearse. Look at the end of verse 9 again. That is the purpose, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. So it's not good enough. It's not, it's not enough for the story of God's salvation to be on our minds. It must also be in our mouths. As David says in Psalm 145, One generation shall commend your works to another. They shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of your mighty and awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. This is what David understands is the the joyful duty of all of God's people. It's not enough just to meditate on these things. It's not just enough to have your own spirits enlivened and your heart warmed by remembering all that God has done for you. These things must be commended. Think of the verbs in that psalm. Declared, spoken, again declared, poured forth, sung. The glory of the gospel must be rehearsed and retold to subsequent generations. And surely this is a word to us fathers on Father's Day. We have to confess that many of us are are the strong, silent type. We like to consider ourselves that. Many Many of us pride ourselves in the fact that we're men of action. You know, talk is cheap. We prefer to teach our children by example. We, we want them to watch us, and, and by watching us, understand, I guess, and take in by osmosis, the things that are most important to us. And what a travesty it is that many people don't know where their dads stand spiritually. I know that because I, I talk with you about that, and I agonize with you about that you just don't know about your dad and his relationship to Christ and and maybe the guy attends church and and maybe he's even a deacon but you've never really had any kind of spiritual conversation with him and they assume that you assume that he believes because of some like outward evidence and the fact that he he goes to church but who really knows and you you're just dying for him to to speak of these things if they're so important to him why doesn't he speak of these things look this is this is spiritually dangerous not just for dads that are like that but for his kids fathers we have a responsibility to bring our children up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. Instruction. That means the use of actual words, not just grunts. And once again, the Lord condescends to our weakness and he condescends to our wickedness in this respect. And he does so by the nature of the the rituals that he commands and also by, by nature of the children that he creates and gives to us. You know, the Lord gives fathers plenty of opportunities to rehearse the truth with their children. You can see how this operates in verses 8 and 14. In the face of two different rituals, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Consecration of the Firstborn, which we'll look at in just a minute, children are 
you know children, they're naturally inquisitive. And so they are, when they are made to um, endure these rituals, you know that they're going to be asking things like, Daddy, why are we doing this? Mommy, what does this mean? And if you have a child, you know that that happens all the time. When the communion plate is passed around, your kid will ask, Mommy, why can't I have a snack like everyone else? Or when uh, Timothy and Caleb get dunked underwater in Kinesis Lake, any thinking kid is going to ask, what in the world is happening here? And all of those are wonderful, God-given opportunities for both fathers and mothers to tell their children great gospel truth. Look at verse 8. Well, Junior, it's like this. I'm eating this bread because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. He brought me out of the house of slavery with a strong hand. You think I'm strong, kiddo. You like it when I flex. Well, that's nothing. The Lord has the strongest hand, and he used it to save me, and he can save you too. And did you catch the personal pronouns there? I'm not talking about the ones that I paraphrase, but I don't need to paraphrase it because in verse 18 and 14, there's a lot of eyes. There's a lot of me's. It's very personalized. And then when you consider that this is an ongoing command for subsequent generations, soon there's going to be a people who they themselves had not experienced the exodus, but still it's their story, and you can tell that they've appropriated it such that they can say, the Lord brought me out of the house of slavery with a strong hand. This is, this is my story. So, so fathers, maybe you are rehearsing the gospel with your kids. Maybe you are teaching them the Bible and theology. But, they, but are they hearing any personal pronouns? They're hearing truth. But are they hearing that it's yours and that you own it and that you love it? Let me ask you this. Do your kids know your testimony? Do, do they know the details of how it was that the Lord rescued you with his strong hand? This is our duty in light of his deliverance, that we would rehearse his mighty acts with our children and with our children's children. And though this, this passage doesn't ex explicitly mention it, the larger context, as we've been seeing all along, certainly leads us to understand that this same duty extends outwards from our own family. What I mean is that we have a duty to share the Lord's saving work with our community, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with our classmates. And then expanding out from there, we have the great duty and the unspeakable privilege. We have a great commission from our risen Christ to go into all the nations with the good news that there is salvation to be had from the strong hand of a father. Thirdly, and finally, we're commanded to relinquish. Relinquish. Just a, just a quick word about the structure of the passage. Maybe you've been sensing it all along. We've already seen that that chorus repeats itself throughout, but there are two main verses to this particular song, and they take the form of instructions for two different rituals of remembrance. So the first, and that's in section 3 to 10, concern the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The second, verses 11 to 16, concern something new, something we haven't heard about yet, which is the consecration of the firstborn. And we're given just the briefest little taste of this in verse 2, where the Lord says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Just a, just a little whistle wetter. And then it's picked up again 
a little bit later. But you can understand right off the bat that the Lord is asserting his right of ownership over the firstborn. Now, of course, we understand that everything is the Lord's. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. We read in scripture that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, it's his. Abraham Kuyper famously said that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. But there's a special sense in which, given the momentous events that have unfolded in the Exodus, all of the firstborn among the people of Israel are to be set apart as his. It, we've seen that he's exercised his right over the firstborn of Egypt, as fathers explain to their children in verse 15. You can see the explanation and how the connection that that uh, the Lord's making here. The Lord exercised his right over their firstborn that night by killing them in judgment. Both the, the firstborn of the, the men, of the people of Egypt, and also the firstborn of their animals. And therefore, because of that, the redeemed people of God are to set, set apart their own firstborn unto the Lord, both man and and beast. Now it gets a little clearer as time kind of progresses. We're not given the full picture here. And so we begin to piece together what exactly that entails, whether it's Hannah giving her firstborn son um, actually, literally, over to the Lord in service for some sort of priestly duty. In fact, in time, the Lord is going to set apart the whole tribe of Levi for priestly service. And he's, he'll say there that, he, that that whole tribe is going to basically act as the firstborn of Israel and be dedicated in that way to him. But, but on its most basic level, to consecrate the firstborn to the Lord involves a few different things. First of all, it involves remembrance of the exodus and of the salvation that was made possible by the execution of Egypt's firstborn, so that Israel's firstborn are so special and so prized. It, it would also involve just a conscious recognition of their special status and a, and a conscious recognition of the fact that the Lord has a right to them. They're his. And then it would involve sacrifice. It, it would be a relinquishing of personal rights to that firstborn, whether man or beast. And I think it's easiest probably if we understand what this looks like in the case of an animal. So let's say your cow has its first calf. That, that animal that first opened up the womb was the Lord's, and it was to be given to the Lord. And that meant that, that means that you can't use it for your common use like you would use cows. No, it, that cow now needed to be sacrificed to the Lord. It had to be killed in an offering to the Lord. Okay, now let's say you had a donkey. Now, this isn't so clear here, but when we understand the fuller revelation of the law of God, we, we come to understand that a donkey is an unclean sort of an animal. And so you got a bit of a problem. The, the male baby donkey is to be set apart to the Lord, but again, as I say, that, that's unclean, so it can't be offered to the Lord on an altar of sacrifice. You can't off, give anything unclean to the Lord. So you've got two options here, and he spells this out in our text. You could kill the donkey, which is you could break its neck so that you wouldn't be tempted to use it for your own purposes, for ordinary work. The Lord could exercise his right over that donkey by having you kill it. But, but that here's the more preferable option, and that is redemption. Redemption. The Lord instructs in verse 13 
that an unclean donkey can be redeemed by a lamb. In other words, a lamb can take the place of that donkey it can, and, and therefore now that lamb can be sacrificed as a substitute for that donkey. Brothers and sisters, sometimes these things just preach themselves. Do you, do you see the picture that the Lord is beginning to paint on the canvas? It's, it's the picture of redemption. It's the initial strokes of a portrait of a spotless lamb of God who will one day be offered in the place of unclean donkeys like me and you. We, we will one day be fully redeemed, and that by the blood of a lamb. Even the firstborn son of God, who belongs to him, who is rightfully his, but who God gave as an offering, as a substitute for us, so that we might be called the sons of God. And the words of, of a typical father to a typical son at the end of verse 15 become the words of a heavenly father who says, all of the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Thank God for the salvation that comes from a father's strong hand. And how shall we respond but by saying, all I have, Lord, is yours. My time, my treasure, my pleasure, my children, my, my whole life, it's yours. We sing, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What can we do in, in light of so great a salvation but to remember May, may, may it be the string around our finger. May it be the mark on our hands or the frontlet between our eyes. And, and what can we do but rehearse this to our children, to our grandchildren, to our whole families, to our neighbors, to the ends of the earth. His, his marvelous deeds must be declared among the nations. And so let us consecrate our children and our young people, let's set them, set them apart. Let's, let's give them to the Lord for this task, and may the Lord be pleased to use them for his redemptive purposes among all the peoples. And what can we do in light of our emancipation but to relinquish all of our rights to give ourselves body and soul as slaves, as sons of our Heavenly Father? Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, mothers, fathers, let, let's go forth living for him and being led by his strong hand. Amen? Amen.